Welcome to Webinar 3, Searching for Humanities, the Promise of Digital. Koralika Golub is Professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at Linnaeus University. She is Head of the I Institute, Co-Leader of the Digital Humanities Initiative and Program Coordinator for Bachelor of Arts in Library and Information Science at the University. Her research has focused on topics related to information retrieval and knowledge organization. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be able to share with you some of the research that have been conducted for the past 20 years or so. And that is more related to the fact that the digital indeed provides a promise of what we can do. However, there is still a premise that needs to be fulfilled uh, for that uh, promise uh, to work. We hear a lot about that everything we need is just a click away. Um, we have Siri who has a commercial that says it does more than ever, even before you ask. So we have technology that reads your mind. We have technology on the bottom part of the screen, flowers, which is actually developed and implemented based on how long you look at one image similar images will be retrieved without you doing anything else. Going a little bit into history, from vision to reality, at the turn of the 20th century, Otle and Lachlan are Belgian lawyers who envisioned and started creating something that they called Mondaneum, which is a large library catalog that you see in this image, envisioned to gather everything there is published anywhere in the world, and then to classify it using universal decimal classification or UDC. Everybody has heard of Memex uh, imagined by Vannevar Bush, which is a predecessor of hypertext, because in 1945, he envisioned a desk that would do everything. It would have access to microforms, microfilms, papers and all the documents in all forms will be connected in parts where they are related, like hyperlinks or hypertext that we commonly use every day today. And today we can, in theory at least, uh, search across everything through a number of different platforms. We have web search engines, Immediately, we can say that research has shown that 90% of pages get no organic search traffic from Google, meaning that only 10% of pages get search traffic from Google unless they pay for it. We have glamorous glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums, so cultural heritage catalogs such as Union Catalog in Sweden, Libris or Kringla from our host today here. We have discovery services, which may be more known to you as OneSearch or Primo. These are commercial services that university libraries pay access to, and through them you are able to search through OneSearch box everything that the library has, but also everything to what the library subscribes. So all individual databases, uh, as well as uh, interdisciplinary databases, can be in theory, at least search through that. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. We also have individual databases like Scopus or Web of Science or individual uh, disciplinary databases that allows us uh, to search on any topic uh, that is out there that the databases um, covers. However, digital methods and automatic methods do not really work all the way. The challenges of searching basically boil down to uh, three main things. The first one is that we need to know how to translate our need for information to the search query. And if we are just new to the topic we need to uh, find information on, we may not be able to know which search terms to use. The second problem is the fact that the natural language is tricky it's not straightforward. It is filled with ambiguities. As we see on these images, we have letter, sink, and nail that are written in exactly the same way, but mean completely different things. 
and we, these are known as homonies. We also use different words to represent the same concept. For example, jaguar is also known as panther or uh, his Latin names. And if we enter jaguar, we will not get all the relevant documents because it is likely that not all authors use all these terms and the other way around. The third problem is that in all these services that um, we that, that say that we can search across everything, we get way too many results. In these examples, if we search for culture, for example, in Google, we get over 5 billion results. In OneSearch, which is a discovery service, we get over 6 million results. In Libris, we get over 100,000 results. All of them are very much un manageable because users really don't go beyond the first one or two pages of 10, 20 results altogether. And this is all fine. It works in many, for many tasks, for many search scenarios. However, for research or serious public inquiry, what we do need is only accurate information and all accurate information. And the only known way until now to deal with this is something called controlled vocabularies. Here, the terminology is also ambiguous. So you will hear of um, terms such as terminologies, knowledge organization systems, information retrieval thesauri, subject heading systems, classification systems, and so forth. Here is an example of how Google, when it started using Knowledge Graph, already saw the benefit of using disambiguation. So if you write Jaguar, of course you will first get uh, listings related to cars because these will be heavily funded and advertised. But if you scroll down on the bottom right page, you will also see results about Jaguar as the animal. So what you get on the right hand side, thanks to Google's knowledge graph technologies, is really information that Google derives from DBpedia, which is essentially a computer readable version of Wikipedia. In a way, Wikipedia has mechanisms to control um, the problems like homonymy and synonymy of the natural language and Google is relying on that. Over 100 years ago, libraries started creating controlled vocabularies. Dewey Decimal Classification, Library of Congress Classification, Library of Congress Subject Headings are some of the early examples. If we look at uh, Library of Congress Subject Headings and rewrite Macedonia, we get a note that here are entered works on the ancient country and kingdom of Macedonia, etc. And if we prefer to look for other Macedonias, then we should look elsewhere. So there is a disambiguation mechanism ingrained in this controlled vocabulary. In addition, we have mechanisms that specifically define different small facets of what the work can be about. That allows us to have a manageable listing of resources. So if we look for general Macedonia, as described here, we have 53 results. If we want Macedonian antiquities, we have 42. If we want Macedonian antiquities exhibitions, we have five. And this is just the very uh, the beginning of several hundreds of different subject headings that describe Macedonia as disambiguated here, so the ancient country and kingdom. So this is one example of controlled vocabulary that has been used in libraries for many decades now. However, what we see today in these search across everything services is um, that none of this is used, which is why we end up with so many unmanageable results. If we write Macedonia into OneSearch, a common discovery service found in Swedish university libraries, we will get almost 65,000 results. Now, if we rely on subject, if we want disambiguation, I want this specific Macedonia, we can't do that. Instead, we get an automatically produced list of facets, as we see on the right hand side here. 
which are, the research has shown, extremely unclear and unmanageable. Macedonia, followed by Eastern Europe, Greece, politics, Albania, history and archaeology, Croatia, it's just a really um, impossible and unusable thing as research has shown as well. On the other hand, in theory, library catalogs and other information retrieval services have been following or trying to follow bibliographic objectives, so aims that any information retrieval system that uh, wants to provide good quality information services needs to address. For example, in 1876 already, uh, very specifically, anything related to finding an item on the subject has been specified. In 2011, this has been elaborated to a greater level so that we need to be able to find anything described by a given subject label, distinguish between similar resources, select resources which are most relevant due to certain facets or approach to the subject. We need to be able to see them in a context, say higher terms, broader terms, narrower terms, or browse around related topics, which is particularly important if we don't know how to formulate the search term. Browsing is really important and it's not really provided in most services today. Then when it comes to research, what research has found related to finding humanities resources by scholars, students, or general public, although primarily it was scholars that were um, the target in these studies so far, we're looking for primary sources, for example, research data or information objects in cultural heritage collections, or secondary sources like monographs, book chapters, journal articles. Research has shown that uh, unlike natural sciences, humanities scholars have very different characteristics, and yet most systems follow the model of natural sciences. Humanities scholars look for a high level of granularity, meaning their search query terms are very specific, which means that we need to apply indexing at deep specificity. In other words, we need to assign very specific keywords. If a book is about Macedonia, we need to really define which specific aspects are addressed there. Also, unlike natural sciences where common terms are dominant, terms denoting named individuals, geographical terms, chronological terms, and disciplinary terms are extremely important in humanities. Of course, this is not the same for every humanities discipline, but it varies. In literary studies, what is important are authors' names and titles of works as subjects as well. In history, specific instances of historical events, people and regions should all be keywords. Religion, philosophy and psychology are more like natural sciences in that they uh, like common terms also. This implies the need that when we create controlled vocabularies, we need to follow standards. And uh, these standards need to provide for high specificity and account for the different facets. Geographical, chronological and disciplinary terms need to be able to combine in a keyword that will be then assigned to denote the topicality of a work. Today, we're also faced with a growing interdisciplinarity throughout sciences and humanities, and not the least through digital humanities. Meaning that what we are faced with is a vast variety of heterogeneous information objects and digital services across disciplines, which means that we need excellent controlled vocabularies. How the big, uh, one of the biggest problems uh, since the 1980s when start, things started turning digital is that um, indexing languages, controlled vocabularies that are applied in libraries traditionally for many decades now have really not been used in interfaces. They have not been made so that you can do query expansion, disambiguation, find narrow terms, broader terms, in interfaces. We do have a lot of experimental interfaces, but um, I assume due to 
politics of how software sellers uh, run on the markets, they have never acquired these aspects, which is why we actually suffer as humanities researchers and, and not just humanities actually. So um, what is the state of the art today? If we look at library catalogs, we have controlled vocabularies in the records, but there is no disambiguation and specificity devices for the end user. Meaning if you do write Macedonia, no library catalog will ask you, well, do you mean Macedonia is the ancient kingdom or the part of Greece or the Republic? And this is actually really a pity because this information is ingrained in Library of Congress subject headings that are assigned to the library records that are being searched for. Also, if we look at new services and new digital collections with some examples from Sweden, none of them have controlled vocabularies that support humanity search needs, meaning many of them do not have any controlled vocabularies at all, a few that do, do not support highly faceted needs and uh, the needs for disambiguation and finding uh, related terms. Discovery services like Primo or OneSearch and are uh, really criticized internationally. The uh, access is way under optimal. Throughout the world, discovery services are criticized for the lack of transparency on the processes behind the scenes. We do not know when they take, for example, an MLA database for languages with uh, LISA database for um, information studies with Scopus or Web of Science and they merge them together and cross search them. We don't know what is really happening and there is no documentation available to us. The very serious lack of mappings between metadata elements and their values, meaning that if two different databases use two different controlled vocabularies, these are not aligned and unified, meaning that there is no use of them at the time of search. We're all stuck with overwhelming number of results. We don't know what we are missing. We don't know in what way we can influence uh, our search. Post search facets, as we have seen in the previous slide on Macedonia, are complex and confusing. So, in spite of the fact that individual collections and databases have been indexed with controlled vocabularies, none of these are of any use at uh, the time of searching in discovery services. So, the question is often raised in research whether providing widened search in loosely controlled discovery services as opposed to traditional library catalogs or individual databases of journal articles, commercial ones, is necessarily an advantage. Again, this may work for known item searching, it may work for quick and dirty searches, but not for subject indexing for serious public inquiry or research when you really need all the relevant information and only relevant information. Also, studies have been conducted on repositories and commercial databases like Diva and Scopus. Scopus claims to be the world's largest commercial abstract and citation database for humanities covering over 3,000 titles. However, they use zero controlled vocabularies from humanities. Um, research has shown that if some humanities articles do have controlled terms from controlled vocabularies, they are not mapped or aligned and they all come from outside the humanities, like medical subject headings or geographical headings. A diva does not use any controlled vocabularies other than um, what is used for statistical purposes. It's based on a Swedish national classification of discipline. It's, it's very broad and very far from the humanities needs of high specificity when uh, talking about aboutness. Also, commercial subject databases with controlled vocabularies are plentiful. They all maintain them and they have them. And here is a list of some examples like Athler Religion Databases, Lisa, Lista, MLA. However, research has shown that their interfaces are so poor when interacting with these controlled vocabularies that 
really um, there is no use of them being there at all. Um, what is also important when uh, in digital humanities or humanities, we often need to create our own metadata and we need to create our own new digital collections that focus on a specific little curious archive that would be uh, very unique and of high value to everybody. What we need to take care of in that case is to then use standards, both at the level of a metadata schema, perhaps you create an application profile on top of a metadata schema if the metadata schema does not account for all the needs. Uh, but especially when it comes to creating subject terms or keywords, we should really start from a controlled vocabulary that is already out there. Many of them are available as linked open data under free licenses. And um, at least what we can do, we can download them and start from there so that we maintain interoperability with the rest of the world, with other collections, so that these uh, collections are accessible through the same interface. And in order to do that, they do need to be interoperable and follow standards. We also need to follow standards to ensure metadata quality, meaning that indexing policies or guidelines on how to assign metadata especially subject metadata need to be in place. We need to ensure that training is in place as well. We, um, research has shown that there is a high inter-indexer uh, inconsistency. So uh, indexing policies are extremely important if we want to provide um, and ensure that good access to information is there. We also need to then create interfaces that support easy use of controlled vocabularies. Otherwise, there is no need for us to use them if we just do simple searches. Well, there is a certain use, but uh, creating additional uh, search parts of a uh, search engine, such as disambiguation, or find me broader terms if I get too few results, or find me narrower terms if I get too many results, is really very easy to implement. So since we talked mostly about subject searching, how do we go about choosing controlled vocabularies? Well, there are a lot of um, what is called terminology registries. Bartok is the biggest one that has over 300 controlled vocabularies in all uh, disciplines. And it also searches over um, several uh, dozens of other terminology registries. Then there are commercial ones uh, like Taxonomy Warehouse. Um, the advantage is that really they earn money on having these services so they may be more updated. Uh, another open source registry is linked to open vocabularies. And um, also there will be a lot of terminologies uh, following projects like conservation controlled vocabularies as a result of Ligatos project. Some examples of humanities and social sciences terminologies are certainly Getty vocabularies that have been um, based on re research more than um, most of the others. Their art and architecture thesaurus is uh, well faceted and addresses the needs of humanities scholars. I do have to say I haven't seen an interface other than one experimental one that uh, does justice to all the advantages that are, are there. HACET and ELSST are two examples of social sciences which also cover big parts of humanities. ELSST is multilingual, meaning that if we want our um, little collection to be interoperable with Europe, uh, this thesaurus covers 14 languages and then again interfaces could be easily built where the translation is automatically done in the background because the mappings already exist. Now all this is probably giving you headaches um, because it is uh, very much resource craving. 
However, we do have um, bibliographic uh, guidelines on what we should do. And on the other hand, we have uh, the commercial market with uh, not so many software that provide these services and there is um, really a huge gap between of what uh, we should have. Anyway, going to what we can do directly, um, say, uh, create our own digital collection or have influence on a digital collection or retrieval system. The alternatives are um, to rely on social tagging or collaborative tagging by end users. Here, um, we also need to use controlled vocabularies. Otherwise, all the effort that is conducted by end users will be in vain because the resulting folksonomies will be unstructured, um, unlinked, there won't be uh, any disambiguation mechanisms and so on. Research has um, conducted social tagging based on Library of Congress subject headings, for example, and users, social taggers, were really happy because they didn't have to think. And um, uh, yeah, the uh, social tagging interface also provided automatic suggestions based on Library of Congress subject headings. And it also showed that it provided them focus because the suggestions were much more focused than they would have had to think about. So they would have, for example, assigned Macedonia period. Instead, Library of Congress subject headings, automatic suggestions provided them with a very detailed aspect. And that effectively showed to contribute to uh, improvement of information retrieval quite significantly as well. Social tagging is also problematic in that we do not know what motivates users and it doesn't always work. Libraries have tried throughout the world over the past 10, 15, 20 years to um, create uh, social tagging interfaces, but few have taken off. On the other hand, some have been very successful, like projects within digital humanities. So social tagging is one alternative to craving resources. Automatic methods are another. However, um, here we also have a lot of problems. We have commercial softwares that claim very high success, yet research has shown that evaluation is highly problematic because context is rarely taken into account and evaluating automatic subject indexing, for example, is uh, loaded with complexities. Also, um, automatic methods still do not work very well beyond text, and they do not work as well on humanities resources as they would um, in an actual science where terms are not so in Think about automatically identifying LGBTQ themes in fiction, where uh, language is purpose metaphorical. So in conclusion, we have seen that with our systems today, the promise of the digital is really large, but we actually fail to achieve bibliographic objectives. We are stuck with loads of results, which we have no idea which of them are relevant, which of them should be excluded, and which of them we didn't get, even though we got one million. And the question is, what kind of impact on research does it have? Are we missing something important? Does this lead to duplication of effort and waste of resources in, in that sense then? And uh, the premise for searching is really to enrich existing services in order to effectively meet the information needs of scholars and uh, for other users, of course. We need to use controlled vocabularies, ideally those that are available as linked to open data because that automatically links to other collections as well. We need to take care of the mappings that are not there, like in discovery services. And we certainly need to improve interfaces. And this is really not hard, it just hasn't ever been implemented in any commercial interfaces. When creating new digital collections, we need to use existing standards, even for social tagging, in order to keep the uh, interoperability and uh, to uh, keep everything as it should be to allow information retrieval. 
uh, as it should be in the end. And um, we could or should probably connect more to international bodies like IFLA is the International Association of uh, Library Associations and Organizations as well as Swedish national strategic bodies in order to push uh, for this for more because we need to get um, uh, our needs as, as they are otherwise we don't know what uh, the losses are. Some references um, are given here at the end and with this I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kralika. Um, I'm sure everyone would love to clap now, but uh, it's just not possible with these online meetings. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was an amazing presentation and I think we all learned a lot about, um, uh, about your work. Um, we already have a few questions in the Q&A, but I want to encourage everyone who's listening to post your questions if you have some in the Q&A section. So let's start with um, one question on SweepUp. So, um, we have a question here on what is your opinion on the sweep up test with automatically built controlled vocabulary? Um, for example, computer learning and getting experience for each index term added. Yes, it, it could work. I think it comes down to um, resources. Uh, sweep up and repositories are really not well funded in general. And um, I think this is where automatic methods and, and well, subject index terms are encouraged to be added by authors anyway, but there should be mechanisms where authors given suggestions from a controlled vocabulary and they could be automatic suggestions. And then uh, the authors um, uh, choose and confirm as, as humans who, who know their work. Um, so uh, certainly here, I think we, we have to try with automatic uh, solutions as you suggest, um, if, if that is what you were asking. If not, please, um, please ask again. Yeah, I think this uh, factor of the human control or the human factor in actually um, working with those um, tags and the next terms um, proposed by um, machine learning and so on is really an, an interesting field um, that's going to be developed in the next years. Um, the next question um, is about interfaces, and I think that was a really, um, inter, um, a really interesting question. Um, you talked a lot about interfaces and uh, their uh, quality. So you mentioned that there is one example of interfaces that does justice. <laughs> um, could you mention which one, or is that tricky? It's not tricky. Unfortunately, it's experimental interface only and um, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's part of a project um, at the University of South Wales. It is well documented in um, literature. They worked with art and architecture thesaurus and um, it is, um, yes, uh, Douglas Tathope. I, I should, should I write in the chat or uh, type answer? Maybe I can type answer. Um, um, no, but if you can maybe um, uh, put in the name in the chat, uh, that would be great. Okay. Um, okay. I actually, so uh, Eva just uh, confirmed at that uh, this was her question, the earlier one, so thank you for your answer there. Um, and now we have another question on researcher generated metadata. So sometimes researcher generated metadata is made with the purpose to create research, making the metadata very specific and therefore not necessarily following controlled vocabularies. Still, this data could be useful for other users. How can this data be recycled into catalogs despite not being a controlled vocabulary? Yes, well, again, it, it depends on how important it is to make it interoperable and linked and what kind of resources are out there. It should be possible to, um, to, to get a little funding. Uh, if, if it's possible to get a little funding, it should be possible to implement a little um, add-in which translates what is already out there into a controlled vocabulary. Um, and then I guess at least 
some kind of general levels rather than very specific is better than nothing. Otherwise, like, even if this is made into linked open data, if it's not linked to the many open vocabularies that are out there as linked open data, it will be a silo on its own still and it won't be found by Google <laughs> or anything else. So I, I think it's possible to, to do a mapping with a little funding uh, project to, to achieve that. It, it shouldn't be cool. So semi-automatic mapping that is then uh, confirmed by a human information professional or subject expert, for example. Great. Um, you already mentioned that would be one of my questions. You already mentioned uh, just now uh, funding as a factor. And um, I kind of, especially also when it comes to interfaces, I think funding is a really interesting um, issue because um, might there be a problem with the kind of project funding that we have in a lot of cultural heritage institutions or in research institutions? Um, that there is just no sustainability available for those interfaces. What do you think on that? Yes, um, I, I think uh, often the problems come from the fact that most public libraries, university libraries cannot afford to build their own and they just buy what is out there. And research has also shown that the managers make these decisions is based on well, it's time to do something new. And they never ask subject librarians or catalog librarians, what should we require? But even if they did, the um, options on the market are so few because none really do these things. So I think we need to start from us that are here today uh, and, and spread to our networks and just demand, we want this in addition. And it's not hard. It's really not hard to add um, based on something that we already have in the database. Well, if you wrote Macedonia, do you Macedonia A or B or C? Because it's in the data. Or um, I only got two results. Um, okay, so then what kind of related search terms are out there that could give you more results? Or if you get a million results, you should narrow it down. And that's just automatically produced by a search engine. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And it was a great call to action. So everyone who's in this chat, so we have to demand things. <laughs> so the next question is about, um, are all controlled vocabularies in accordance? I'm thinking, does it matter which one I choose to use? Unfortunately, no, they're not. Um, but I would, um, I would look at similar collections with similar topics and um, I would go with the ones that are widely used um, if possible and also the ones that are available as linked to open data uh, for all the other reasons that we want to achieve with with open data that are linked um, so um, yeah otherwise it takes a little bit of research to to see which ones um, are good also it can be so that your collection would require some additional uh, terminology that can also be accommodated as long as we start with from something that is already out there and we already have a communication with with the rest of the world great thank you um another question thank you very much for the presentation when you ask users to provide crowd or community tagging contrasting views on the resource may emerge this can be beneficial to include previously unheard voices in the archive. What happens when these perspectives are not included in theory and controlled vocabularies as well? Yes, yeah, this is a great question. And I would, I would say that we actually need all perspectives. We need manual based on controlled vocabularies. We need social tagging and we need even automatic methods because automatic methods are consistent and they discover topics which we may not think of as librarians because we're all not just representing information when creating keywords, we are also uh, creating information research on a lot. So I would use all of them. It's just that they, um, they all need to be moderated. Even the manual ones need to be moderated to, to be in line with indexing policy in place. 
And um, in, yes, social tagging certainly has its advantages. And, and these um, additional perspectives that they may provide in say in layman language that it's control vocabularies are pretty slow to change and update uh, with new uh, terms. So this is, I think they're really complementary, which is why libraries wanted to provide social tagging services. It just hasn't taken off. And we don't really know why the motivation wasn't there when it is in other services. Why? What I would like to dive deeper in that. Um, what do you think? Why? Uh, what could you imagine with your reasons why it didn't take up? Well, I th I think um, library catalogs are maybe not um, as popular as other services like Library Thing or Goodreads or uh, Delicious. A uh, long time ago, was a bookmarking service um, that people thought was cool, and you know people. Um, maybe weren't happy with the way library catalogs were doing search because they weren't doing justice to search. And then they just went to Google, which, you know, you don't know what you're getting, you don't know what you're missing, you don't know where the information is coming for, from, who is um, in charge of the information, but it's easy and it's there, so let's go with that forgetting all the valuable information that is in libraries, but maybe it's because library catalogs weren't good enough and still aren't. Sorry for being provocative. <laughs> no, 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 you're just being honest. And uh, I mean, that's, we have to demand this kind of honesty as you just said, uh, so that actually we can learn and uh, don't have to repeat mistakes that others have made. Um, so there's a Swedish uh, um, related uh, Sweden-related question. As we are in Sweden, what's your view on Svenska Ennesord? I, I haven't studied it myself in detail. I think I looked at it in a paper or two. Um, I, I think it's largely based on Library of Congress subject headings and since uh, Kobe is turning very much into linked open data, hopefully, um, or maybe it's already out there. I, I think it's actually out there as LOD. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think it, if it's all down to resources and motivation, uh, we need to be able to cover for all the perspectives that are out there. Uh, and as long as we have people who maintain it and who, maintain, who um, update it, uh, then it's good. My problem with Libris is that um, it merges wonderfully all these catalogs from different libraries, but it doesn't do any mapping of the different vocabularies that are used. So Svenska Emnesword is one, um, but then we have a Quinsum, we have medical subject headings, and they're all there, but they're not mapped to each other. Meaning if you search for one term um, from one, uh, from Svenska Emnesword, you will not retrieve resources that are indexed using medical subject headings, which could also be relevant. Uh, so that, that is my main <laughs> sort of, when uh, will this be fixed? But uh, having said that, resources for these sorts of efforts are lacking throughout and hopefully linked to open data initiatives will, will take care of it in some, we just need to talk about it and demand things. <laughs> Um, then I would have another question myself. I'm really interested in social tagging and um, you also mentioned issues with LGBTQ um, content, for example. And um, I just have a recent um, example for Pride Month. I worked with um, a Svensk Dam imitator, so a female impersonator, um, which is one uh, specific term you used in the past to describe this kind of content. But now you would use other um, terms that um, nowadays communities perceive as um, much more fitting than uh, um, earlier derogatory terms also. So um, would you give me some insights on that? What do you think about this? Yes, it's extremely difficult to um, do anything about it. In research has also shown that even um, trained catalog librarians often miss LGBTQ themes because um, they are still hidden, especially in fiction. And um, finding these topics, full text search like Google, 
is impossible unless you actually denote it with a term. So um, it, it really demands also training of uh, librarians and um, indexing policies, especially in place for such difficult uh, topics and maybe you know, national level of, of training. And, and trying to do this automatically, maybe it's possible. It's just really, really a challenging problem compared to say, um, automatically identifying topics in, in physics where pretty much you use one specialized term and it means only one thing or not many <laughs> than you know, unlike humanities. So that's a really good example as terminology also changes over time. And, and some of these things are um, uh, ingrained in controlled vocabularies as well. They, they have history of terms um, to varying degrees. And some also have problems and biases, they still do. For example, Library of Congress subject headings up until 2006, if you enter the term Vietnamese war, you got zero hits because the war was never really declared uh, the, the term used was Vietnamese conflict and uh, only in 2006 they introduced Vietnamese war as a synonym so you could get to books um, mm, about okay. that but things like that are there um, so yeah information creation not just information representation I'm sorry there are so many problems with this <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I thought you would uh, show us all the solutions today <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think my co-host, uh, uh, Osa, also has a question. Um, Osa, do you want to share? Yes, I, I thank you very much, Cara. This has been really, I'm actually going to keep looking through this presentation several times so I can really learn this. Uh, I just had a sort of a uh, question coming myself from a research background and you're now working at the university. Uh, do you feel like uh, that people working with library and archive information studies, they understand these problems. Do you feel like you get uh, that there is an increased interest among humanities researchers or is it still that they're completely like, what don't quite understand the issue? I don't think they do. Um, right now we're doing a study with uh, PhD students in humanities and um, they are not aware of it. Those that received training receiving in their disciplinary commercial databases or one search but because interfaces uh, for controlled vocabulary individual databases are so poor they couldn't use it or they gave up that's one problem and the other problem is that you know, many people just like Google Scholar and um, the they seem to be finding what they need some who use a lot of different resources have, have told us that um, they're often missing information due to the complexities of natural language. But some are just very self-assured that, no, nope, we are finding everything we need. But how can you ever check when you get a million results and you still don't know what is not there? And again, for some tasks, maybe you don't need everything. But for some, like rare humanities primary objects, it could be very important that they are very standardized and interoperable and linked. Um, um, yeah, definitely, because I really feel like and one of the things that human, the humanities like to push is that we're very good at finding and dealing with information, but I, I, I speak for myself here, uh, even though I'm a lot on the internet and using internet, I. I realize that I am not quite, uh, there is so much thing, many things happening that I probably don't have, the, the tools that I were, were taught are not necessarily always useful today. And also, of course, everyone is more stressed, everyone is uh, under a lot of pressure. So you search and then you take the first thing you get and you forget what is hidden, what you can't find, or would, what you would have found if you had used a different terms you really think that this is a very central issue for the humanities especially as more and more is digitized but there is still the 99 percent is not digitized or has proper metadata so we think we find things and but so we are we'll actually be in a 
worse situation than we were when we know that we had to go to a certain archive and look in that archive to know if something was found. Now we sort of expect that, that we found everything. So that could actually be a bigger issue going forward. Indeed, uh, there, there is, a, yes, I, I know there is a historian, re, a researcher in history who changed her historian focus to study uh, the effects of using digital archives and she's saying something like that because um, yeah, some aspects are just not well recorded. You know, some archives just digitize the title page but not the verso page and that's needed in an archival studies uh, or they don't write the metadata when this was done, how this was done, and yeah, and just historians, just because something is not digital, younger ones may assume, well, it's not out there, <laughs> and, and, and so on. But actually, most people that I have uh, interviewed in this study, they said we have realized during peer review or too late in an embarrassing situation that we couldn't find what we should have. Um, so, but, but I, I don't think the problem is, um, um, just the lack of skills, it certainly is. It is the fact that none of this really works <laughs> as it should. <laughs> not even expensive commercial uh, individual database, not even school or web of science. Of course it works if, if you know um, which item you wish to find and if you know the author and you want to look for works by the author, but if you're looking by topic, um, you, it's, which, which is also has shown the most common and the most complex type of searching, then um, there are very few systems that, that can help with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to head over to Anna now. Um, she's going to make some concluding remarks on uh, your presentation and uh, then we're um, heading to the FICA break already. Um, but thank you very much also from my side again, Koralika. Thank you. Thank you, Koralika, for a fascinating discussion uh, on the political implications of controlled vocabularies. And I would like to start uh, for a few minutes in a couple of things. Uh, for example, the political dimensions of this high specificity of data that we have. I think that is what I hold from uh, the, the conversation that we nationally and in different uh, places, different European countries, we use controlled vocabularies. They're not always interoperable. It's like we really need to have a communication at a deeper techno administration level. Yes. That is what we need to do. It's a, it's a, it, I think it's in line with what Europeana wants to do as well. And I think that uh, it's always good to, to step, when it comes to infrastructures of that kind, it's always good to step on, on collaboration and on what's been there before and sort of advance this and make these infrastructures generative. I, I don't know how you feel about that. These are just my reflections right now. No, I feel very frustrated. <laughs> I have been feeling extremely frustrated about it for many years now. Um, the first question was many years ago, from a colleague of mine when I was teaching students about how great controlled vocabularies are and she said but show me one example where this is actually used in practice I couldn't <laughs> 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 and uh, yes certainly now you know if we want to be um, interoperable cross searchable which we all do and we all working with uh, semantic web standards hopefully through that we can do something but it is also the fact that there seems to be a lack of um, vision from people. They not, may not even be aware uh, that they're not getting what they should and therefore they're not demanding. Yeah. I heard a librarian say, well, 80% of our searches are known item searches. And of course they are mm -hmm. because you're a university library. Most of your users are undergrad students who look for student literature. But what about the 20% who are actually writing theses and researchers who can make a difference, hopefully? <laughs> um, you know, and, and you, you provide, you just buy an expensive service called Watch uh, that maybe has a nice interface like Google, but you have no idea what is happening in, in, in the background. And this is where we need mappings. Um, we need 
mappings between highly specific vocabularies to, to broadens and everything across. So everything that is covered by one large search service, uh, the vocabularies used in databases need to be mapped to each other or um, there are already many mappings between them, especially now through LOD projects. So why not implement that at a level of search and at a level of interface as well? Um, I just I think it's very interesting just to catch up from the discussions that we had before uh, yesterday. Uh, it's quite interesting because you you used what we call in in traditional and 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 uh, linguistic human linguistics perhaps we call this onomastics. You in in some weird way when you spoke about Macedonia, the description of the name and what it means through the ages. I mean it changes depending on the spatial and temporal sort of context of it. And I think in 2020 we have to be in a situation to be able to include everything and open knowledge and, 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 you know, enjoy the multiplicity and the diversity that we have. And this is something that you also have with very, very old maps. I think if my colleague Alexandra Petrulevich was here from uh, Uppsala University, who is an expert in onomastics, she would say something uh, about it, because that's something that it's very interesting. How we describe things is always, it's time to use technology to harness it, to make it for all and open and accepting and inclusive. Yes, uh, certainly. And, and this is also um, what Larissa was mentioning before about how terminology changes, but it's not just terminology, it's what terms cover and mean, especially in the example of Macedonia. And having a great control vocabulary that accounts for it all is a first step. I do not see that um, an automatic algorithm could be the only solution, but it could help. It could be semi-automatic solution, which would make this faster. And because they are consistent and they can learn based on human input, we, we should combine that, of course. But yes, the, the, we have all those challenges. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. I, there is one, um, question still? Shall I, Larissa, do you want to, or? Lar Larissa, oh, Larissa your sound is not on. Sorry, so I'm just, it's, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment, but I'm going to read it um, aloud for all of you. Um, but from the library, for example, you can have interfaces with partly visible pre or post coordinated vocabularies, like accessible indexes, that might help to make vocabularies more open. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, certainly, I, I, I just agree with that. Um, especially what is important um, is to allow browsing, meaning tree-like hierarchical structures of terms. Because if you don't know where to start, what your search term is, th those are really, really useful. We did a study um, of a Renardo's uh, service which, was, uh, which wanted to catalog the web it was an EU funded project and it was based on duodecimal classification. And it turned out that actually 70% of people browsed the hierarchical tree of the classification system rather than use the search box. We don't know why, because it was a log analysis, uh, but um, the, the fact that search engines use just one search box, we shouldn't forget that we can't always know which search terms to use. Browsing structures are actually useful for learning. So they are a knowledge structure like that. And we should have both, uh, yes, as, as Eva suggests, um, some kind of indexes, both for searching and, and for browsing directly available. And that's just really easy, also implementable in an interface. You don't need high artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, to do any of it. It's directly there, and many of them are um, uh, open data, so they should be made available. Thank you very much, Kulika.